Ride is brought to you by your 31 Metro Detroit Ford dealers. It is the musical event of 1995. The Beatles are back. Two brand new songs after 25 years. The big special on ABC. It's Beatlemania all over again. You remember the first time around with the Beatles wigs and the fan mags and the bubblegum cards? Maybe the first time you saw them was on the Ed Sullivan Show back in 64, like I did. Or maybe you were lucky enough to see them in person at Olympia in 64 and 66. But before the world fell in love with the Beatles, it was already moving to Motown. The Beatles included. And tonight we're going to look at the influence Motown had on the Beatles. We'll also be talking to Bob Seeger about the influence the Beatles had on Detroit rock and roll. But first we're going to take a trip down memory lane to 1964. And I hope you'll join us. I'm Guy Gordon, and this is Perspective. Detroit remembers the Beatles. They were too young for Elvis and too old for the Beach Boys, a generation searching for a sound that spoke their language, and they found it in a group of musicians from England with funny haircuts called the Beatles. the group made their famous appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show in February 1964, Detroit teenagers, like kids all over the country, were crazy over the Beatles. There's an old Beatles song that goes, there are places I remember all my life, but some have changed. Well, this is one of those places that has changed. This is the site of the old Olympia Stadium. It was here on September 6th, back in 1964, that the Beatles made their Detroit debut. 13,000 screaming, frenzied fans back into Olympia. They paid five bucks a piece to see their idol. The stadium is gone, but the memories are very vivid. You couldn't hear the Beatles, even though we were like maybe 20 feet from them. You, if we were that far, you could not hear them. All you could hear was screaming and thundering, applause and yelling, and it was so loud that it was painful. Tatiana is a college professor and the mother of five. In 1964, she was a 16-year-old in love with the Beatles. She keeps a yellowed newspaper clipping and a tattered old scrapbook, a reminder of that 64 concert. It's a picture of me with my girlfriends, and we're in the front row of the uh, concert. We were all obsessed with them. That's all that we talked about. We all wanted to wear, looked at fashion magazines, wanted to wear English fashions. We used to, we were girls, we used to try and talk in English accents because we, it was, we just wanted so much to be identified with the Beatles and to be English. And, and I remember even the outfit I wore to the 66 concert, I wore beetle boots. I bought uh, tight pants that had a, a fine pinstripe to them because I, it was a British look that I had seen in the magazine. Everything they did, we just thought was so hysterical. Our parents could not understand their humor or their haircuts or their dress. And so this was just so rebellious. Well, you were just Sally was just 17 when she skipped school at Cass Tech and waited in line the entire day to get Beatles tickets. On concert day, she snuck off to Metro Airport to try and catch a glimpse of her idol. We thought they were coming in um, in one certain area of the airport, and so we dressed in our most mod outfit, you know, with the, tech, the, the black textured stockings and our little Mary Janes and our black turtlenecks, thinking we were looking very English, so that they would spot us immediately in the crowd, you know. But then we heard in the crowd that they were going to the Whittier. So the four of us got into the car, and Brent, my brother-in-law, drove us to the Whittier. And um, they had guards in the, in the lobby, naturally, to keep us from going upstairs. And my sister uh, tried to buy the guards drinks so that we could sneak past them and get up to the whatever floor they were on. Well, it didn't work. Not to miss a chance to capitalize on their famous guests, the Whittier Hotel cut up the sheets and the pillowcases that the Beatles were supposed to have used, and then they sold off small squares of the bed linens to eager teenagers. Oh, it's the real thing because the hotel manager of the Whittier Hotel and the Muhlenbach Hotel signs an affidavit certifying that this is the Beatle bedding they slept on, and who slept on what sheet and was belongs to who, Ringo, George, or Paul. 
Now, when you get these things cut up into one square inches a piece, what are you going to do with them? Sell them. Beatlemania meant big bucks for record companies, and it changed the meaning of success for the radio business. Back in the 60s, Tom Gilardi was the record rep for Capitol Records, the Beatles label. We were selling records in the kinds of figures that had been so far above and beyond anything we'd ever experienced could not press fast enough. I would get a release, and if I took it to CKLW, I had to have someone in my office bring it to WKNR at the same time because they couldn't get it five minutes separated because if they did, one would put a disclaimer over the record. They'd put their call letters over the record quietly underneath so it couldn't be taped. It was pure mania. Your music felt good. It made you feel happy. Uh, it was just right for the time. We all want to change the world. The world was changing, and so were the Beatles. They returned to Detroit in August of 1966, and though the fans were still enthusiastic, there were fewer of them. Concerts in Olympia didn't even sell out. One newspaper reporter observed that the Beatles seemed to be losing fans, but finding themselves. They were a little older and much wiser. Still stinging over the response in the United States to a comment John Lennon made about the Beatles being bigger than Jesus. Beatle records were banned on some radio stations, and there were bonfires to burn Beatles material in a number of American cities. At the Beatles concert in Detroit, the protest consisted entirely of five angry young college classmates. It was just an issue of this cocky young band from England who was going to make a lot of money in this country to, to make that statement. It just didn't hit us right. Will owns an industrial lighting company today, but in 1966, he and his buddies were looking to make a statement. There was a couple of signs, Lie Me, Go Home, uh, you know, uh, Stomp Out the Beatles. Uh, and finally, you know, the police had to come around us and keep us from, you know, being uh, harassed by the crowd of young screaming uh, fans. Will had a change of heart when interviews with the band revealed that Lennon's comment about Jesus and the Beatles had been taken out of context. I pointed out that fact in reference to England, that we meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I wasn't knocking it or putting it down, I was just saying it as a fact. As time went on, I became a very big Beatles fan as well. I can remember, you know, way waiting for the new White album to come out in 69, or, or the Magical Mystery Tour came out, wow. Those albums came later in the Beatles' career, but 1964, well, it was a simpler time. For the Beatles and for a generation of kids that were growing up along with their idols, for those fans, even today, nothing quite compares to the sound of those early years. So love me, do. I listen to their old songs. I like some of the newer ones, but I still love the old ones. I always will, because it brings back memories. Coming up, the magic of Motown and its impact on the Fab Four. Plus, rock legend Bob Seger talks about the Beatles and Detroit rock and roll.